I have this one in the dream. Hey guys, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you all for coming. Um, my name is Erica. I'm the president of the Student Nurses Association. And we're just going to um, go over a couple of business things before we talk about the fee increase proposal. So first of all, I wanted to let you guys know that we are now accepting applications for next year for um, per Student Nurses Association board members. And that's like us up here. It's a great opportunity. It's a wonderful resume builder. It's a great chance to network, to meet people, to, um, to work in the College of Nursing. And it's just a wonderful opportunity. So those forms are available on Org Sync. And um, we will be accepting them. And um, what we want to do is work with the new members for next semester. So that way, when it's the um, when it's you guys' turn to take over next year, you guys will know what's going on because you'll be with us for a semester. So we want to get that rolling and get going um, and getting the new officers in and accustomed to everything that's going around with SNA. Um, what else? We have the Lydia's House donation drive. And that ends Thursday at 9 a.m. And they're the ones that are accepting um, the diapers. They're the whole list of everything that they need is listed on OrgSync. I know it's like diapers and bottles and stuff like that. So that ends Thursday. Toiletries. Toiletries. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The list is on there. Um, so that's all I have. So I'll, and Tara, the treasurer, is not here. But um, I went to a meeting for the budget proposal, or for the budget to submit our budget for SNA last week. So we will be working on the new budget, and that's open in January, and we'll be working on that. So that's all I know for Treasurer. Mm -hmm. um, just a quick note of business. Uh, we've got the, the deadline for point submissions coming up, and I know there's been a lot of issues with um, people submitting stuff, and it's not reflecting what you guys, the work you guys put in. Um, so to at least partially mitigate that, today we have a, a sheet that we're going to be going around. It's got everybody's name and what they've done so far. And if, if you look at your name that's not accurate, please just fill in what you think or what you did, and um, we'll just kind of we'll go from there with you, and we'll make sure that's all sorted out so you get your points. Uh, that's about it for me. Um, it's I just got an email from Amazon today. They said, um, "Hey, this book you bought um, a year and a half ago, we want to buy it back from you." Um, but instead of selling that book, um, every semester I give my books to John. That the ones I'm not going to use for the next semester. Um, because they were given to me um, by Jeremy, um, Jeremy Pfeiffer, I think everybody knows him. Um, so we just pass them down so we, don't, we can save costs. If you have books that you, you think you might want to give away or you want to get from someone in the cohort above you or you want to um, maybe say, hey, instead of you, me selling this to the bookstore for, for 60 bucks, how, why don't you buy me lunch and I'll give you my books or something like that. Work it out or something. You can go on to WorkSync. There's a discussion post about that. Try to save everybody a little bit of money. Um, and so get on to WorkSync if you want to try to make a deal with your books, with your people in front of you and behind you in cohorts. Um, and as you all know, um, Dean Susan Dean Barr is here to talk to us about the, um, the proposed uh, increase in our supplemental fees. So um, thank you for coming. And the uh, floor is yours. So what I'm passing out right now is the same um, handout that I provided um, a couple weeks ago when I met with the um, leadership for the Nursing Student Association and the Multicultural Nursing Student Association, and the same handout that went to the Student Government Association five, six days earlier than that. So let me talk a little bit about the history, and then I'll, I'll also walk you through the proposal that you've got. Um, for a number of years now, the College of Nursing budget has been shrinking, and actually shrinking by a lot. And so you'll see as part of what's on this handout is since um, fiscal year 11, which would have been academic year 2010 to 2011, um, the College of Nursing budget has actually seen a, a decrease, a reduction by $1.1 million in our base budget. In the last three years, we've seen an additional, and, and, and from the University of Missouri system, what we call that, the base budget is what we call the rate budget. In addition to that, over the last three years, we have seen what they call one-time cost reductions, which are just, 
they just take it for one year and the next year you get the, the money back from your base budget. But in addition to those rate cuts, we've seen a decrease of um, just over $8,000 to last year $103,000. We will see another one-time cost cut this year, but we don't know what that is yet. I will tell you it will be more than $103,000, but I don't know how much. So I have been, I've been here for a little over two years, uh, came in July of 2012. And in that time, have been working with the campus administration around the fact that we were on the path of an unsustainable budget for the College of Nursing. You'll see in the handout that you've got that since fall of 2008, we have uh, increased, you'll see that what, at the undergraduate level, we've increased in the major, not the pre-nursing students, just the students who are in the clinical major, we've seen an increase of 137% in the number of students accommodated in the major. And overall, when you include the graduate students as well, we've seen a 57% increase in the overall enrollment in the, in the college. For a number of years, we were pretty successful at being um, able to secure funding from outside the normal funding streams. So we received, you'll see in the second paragraph underneath that table, you'll see that we received a total of almost $1.7 million from the state in one-time money in an initiative that was called the Caring for Missourians. That was given to health professional um, education programs across the state in public universities. So it wasn't just nursing, it was nursing and medicine and PT and OT and a lot of different things. And it wasn't just the University of Missouri system. That was money that came from the state of Missouri to public higher education in a number of, of uh, fields. The Umsel College of Nursing was the recipient of 1.7 million of that money. Um, in addition to that, for, the, for three years, we were able to receive money from the um, Nursing Education and Senate program, and that was about another $150,000 a year for three years. That money is now all gone. It was one-time money. That's all gone. The couple of places where we thought there might be additional money specifically for health education and that nursing might have been the um, recipient of, did not come through. It was part of what happened in the budget negotiations at the state level, and it came out of the proposals, and we got no additional outside funding. You should know that um, since, 20, since the year 2000, it, well, I should say in the year 2000, the state accounted for about 62% of the funding for the University of Missouri system. And tuition only was needed to cover about 29% of the costs and about 9% came from other sources, research money, that kind of thing. In 2015, the amount of money that comes from the system to fund the University of Missouri system campus, or the amount of money that comes from the state to fund the University of Missouri system campuses has dropped down to 36%. Now, I will also tell you that that's up a little bit. Last year, it was 34%, so we saw an ever so little, but nonetheless, a little bit of an increase in state funding from the university from the state to the University of Missouri system. But if you get a decrease from 62% to 36%, you still have to find resources. And so you've seen a significant increase in tuition funding the operations of the University of Missouri system. So in 2000, tuition accounted for about 29%, and in 2015, we're up to 51%. We've also increased revenue from other sources from 9% to 13% across the system. Now there's a little bit of difference from campus to campus. Those are University of Missouri system data. And each campus is a little bit different because of its mix of programs and all of those types of things. So you've seen this increase in tuition. You've also seen an increase in um, supplemental fees for the College of Nursing. Um, there, there has been, all, it is very common to see a supplemental fee for nursing programs. Until 2009, the fee here in the College of Nursing was $150 a credit, and it had stayed the same for years. I wasn't here. They tell me for years, decades. It had never been increased. What happened, to, so you saw the change that was happening from 2000 to 2015. So in 2009, the decision was made that we had to start um, increasing the supplemental fees. <coughs> nursing programs have these supplemental fees, particularly in public universities, because the cost of nursing programs is very, the cost of health professional programs. The two most expensive programs on most campuses are nursing and engineering. They're just extraordinarily expensive because of the cost of faculty and the cost of equipment, 
all of those things combined. So it's very common to see supplemental fees. What happened is that the College of Nursing now finds itself in a position where we are running a $1 million a year deficit. And so the, I have been in very close communication and numerous meetings I, with me, Dr. Allen. You all know Dr. Allen. She's the um, Assistant Dean for Student and Faculty Affairs. And I've also got um, Ms. Angela Lilly, who's our Assistant Dean for Business with us. So those are the people that she is my right hand around some of this stuff. Um, and we have been in numerous meetings with the, co with the campus around we cannot sustain a million dollar deficit. We simply can't do it. So what are the alternatives? The alternatives are to go back to where we were enrollment wise and significantly decrease enrollment or figure out a plan to close that million dollar gap. On October 30th, um, I received information from the provost that said we have a plan. The plan is the following. We will, as a campus level, we will reallocate through the budget and planning process $350,000 a year for the next fiscal year and another $350,000 the fiscal year after that. So that in fiscal years run, so we're in fiscal year 15 now, ends June 30th, 2015, we call that fiscal year 15. So we will increase the funding by 350,000 from the campus for fiscal year 16, and an additional 350,000 for fiscal year 17, which will, which will provide $700,000 of that million dollar deficit. In addition to that, the campus said, but we need to increase your student fees to close the rest of that gap. And so October 30th was when that was the decision that was made from campus. The fee proposals were due to the campus on November 12th, I believe. It was a Wednesday, whatever that date was. The fee proposals were due to campus. We quickly did the fee uh, proposals. We actually, not at the undergraduate level, but at the graduate level, we took the opportunity the graduate level had multiple fees, and we combined them all, and they were all within seven or eight dollars of each other. We combined all those fees into one graduate fee and one graduate clinical fee. So instead of having about seven or eight supplemental fees, we are now down to one undergraduate fee and two graduate fees. Um, so we submitted those to the campus on the um, 12th of uh, November. The the student fees must be reviewed by the Campus Student Government Association. And so we made that proposal to the Student Government Association on their meeting on um, November 14th, that Friday. They, we got about a week's notice about when that meeting would occur. And then the following week, on November 20th, I met with the leadership of both the Nursing Student Association and the Multicultural Student Association. So this has all happened very quickly. It's happened from, from October 30th until what's today December 8th um, so there's been a lot of activity in the course of about five weeks um, we have not uh, this is not something we take lightly in, in the best of all worlds we would not have to do this we would not have to do this but in the real world we have to make expenses 94 percent of our overall college budget is salary we have very little of our budget that is in non-salary expenses um, and the majority of that non-salary is the stuff that goes to fund the lab downstairs. Our, our, um, those mannequins that you use, they at the moment are running minimum $70,000. Some of the brand new ones that are coming out are up to $200,000. They carry a $12,000 a year uh, maintenance fee um, that you only pay for about three or four years because after that they're at the end of their life and it's really time to buy a new one. But for those three or four years, you have to pay that annual maintenance fee on, on top of uh, what it costs to purchase it. So, so you'll see, um, we've tried to give you as much information as we can. Um, nursing faculty salaries are among, again, the only ones that are higher on a campus are, now, in this case, engineering gets a competitor. Um, college and business faculty are equally expensive vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the campus. And that is because in engineering business and in nursing, Faculty can go work in their fields at significantly more money. So our average cap, uh, faculty salary here in the College of Nursing right now, for all of our faculty, we have 50 full-time faculty. Uh, uh, it runs about $81,000 a year per faculty. That's the average, which means we've got some folks that are making in the mid-60s, and we've got some folks that are making over 100. Depends on 
master's prepared, PhD prepared, how many years they've been a faculty, what their role is, all of that. Our goal is to stay at the national median for faculty salaries in the Midwest in public universities. And we are barely there. We are barely there. We are still there, but we are losing every year because we haven't seen salary increases. Um, faculty, the most the faculty have seen in salary increases is just under 2%. And in the last five or six years, there have been several years where faculty did not get any pay raises. And as you might imagine, it's hard to retain people when, when their costs are going up, but we're not able to increase their salaries. So that's the proposal that you have before you. Um, what you have at the very end of the proposal is what it costs to attend UMSL versus what it costs to attend other places. And so you can see, so that that table um, the information that's in the table is current 2014, except for UMSL. The last line on that table is what we are projecting UMSL's costs would be next year. So you know that the other ones that are there are going to go up next year. We just don't know how much they're going to go up. So it's a little bit of, um, you know, I'm comparing what UMSL's costs next year will be to what the current costs at all those other places are. But even with that comparison, you can see that we still are an incredible value. The only place that costs less than us is SAU Edwardsville, and that's based heavily on their decision in the past year to take any Missouri student and count them as in-state for Illinois. That's a new, that's only a year-old decision on their part. So that's, that's saying that if somebody went to SAU Edwardsville, they would pay um, Illinois resident tuition. So they're the only program that is even close to what we would pay. Our nearest competitor is uh, Maryville. We'll be at about $15,000 a year, a little more than that next year. Maryville this year is at 24-7. Um, so we're still going to be $10,000 plus thousand dollars less than what um, Maryville charges. So we don't, trust me when I say if there was an alternative to this, we would choose it. We have looked at every different option that we can. Um, we do. We believe that there's still great value in this program. We do not think it'll affect um, enrollment at all. We still have two to three qualified applicants for every space that we've got. The increase in fees will be taken into account when they calculate the cost of attendance so that financial aid will be calculated off of, as it is now, Nursing students have a higher cost of attendance than if you were a history major. And so that will continue. These fees will get built into that so that students will have eligibility for financial aid because their cost of attendance will be higher. So that's the overview. Those of you who were at the meeting when we met a couple weeks ago, what did I miss? And for the rest of you, questions. Um, I think it might be important to talk about the process. Um, you said they, um, the, the Provost's office came to you on the 30th. Mm -hmm. The fee proposal was submitted on the 12th. SGA. Now, was there a, was there a report from SGA after the because it has to yeah. go through them? Yeah, SGA just submitted that. Just um, well, I don't know when they released the report. I saw the report yesterday or Friday, and um, the SGA approved approved the fee. And are there any student nurses in on that committee? I do not believe so. There were none in the room the day I presented. I don't know. Tara seemed pretty knowledgeable about the process, so I don't know whether she might have been, but not at the meeting, because she seemed really knowledgeable. When we met, she seemed pretty knowledgeable about the SGA process. So. And then what's and then then you present this fee increase to the. Actually, now what happens is it's out of the College of Nursing and into the hands of the campus. The campus has put together, like all four campuses, have put together a proposal that will go to the curators. It's my understanding that that discussion won't happen by the curators until January. Um, but I but I don't know when the curators will do that. Yeah, Bob. Uh, Bob. Bob Samples, yeah. Um, Who can answer this curator question better than me? Well, the only reason I would, because I didn't know about this meeting until the media called me. Uh, but the. Uh, on the board agenda, there is an information item that says preliminary. It's under information, it's preliminary FY16 tuition and fees. So my gut impression is they'll discuss 
the different proposals from the campuses. I haven't seen it. I don't know if the nursing would talk. Yeah. But, well, it, but that's 415 on Thursday. Yeah. I think that's when it's slated. Yeah, and my understanding what is what's going to happen is they're going to talk about the tuition piece, but they're going to defer any decision making on fees until sometime in January because there's a new system CFO and he and the president and the comptroller and the system director of uh, budget are doing a uh, tour of the state the week of <coughs> December 15th and spending one day on each of the four campuses talking about budget things and they wanted to wait until those meetings were all done before they actually uh, dealt with fees that were that were specific to campuses or specific to programs. Yeah. Is there any particular reason that they chose to do those meetings during finals week when most people wouldn't be very attentive to? Those meetings are private, they're not open. Those meetings will only be the president, the provost, our vice chancellor for managerial and technological services, and the system people, those are not open meetings. There, there, there will, on Thursday, there will be public Curators meeting. At the right. curators meeting. Yeah, curators meeting this week, Thursday and Friday, are um, open. Well, a good portion of them are open. There are some closed sessions both on Thursday and Friday. And where but, are those located? Um, they're over in the Millennium Student Center. I don't know exactly which room. Right. We will um, be in the room. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and I think that the public portion starts at 2 o'clock on Thursday. They, they, they start the meeting at 11, but they're going to the executive session, and then they're not coming back until 2 o'clock. So, and I think 2 o'clock, 2 o'clock. Well, there's an well, agenda. The finance committee, if, 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 you, if you want to go online, the curator, you just go to the website. They right. have, it's a public meeting, so the agenda is posted. And I think what I read before I came here was at 415, the finance committee, is it, among its items is this tuition and fees. I, and I haven't seen the documents, so I don't know what's yeah, in it. Maybe. But that, that's where they would talk about it as curators. On and Friday, the, the agenda for the curators meeting was not yet posted. I have to admit, I didn't look at the website today. It wasn't posted on Friday. It typically doesn't get posted until a couple of days before the meeting, but it's on. they're always on the University of Missouri system website, always. But they frequently, and the dates for those meetings, back to why are they meeting then, the dates for the curator meetings are set a year in advance, and there's, it's always the second week, the end of the second week of December, and typically that's the one that UMSL hosts. So the Board of Curators does five in-person meetings a year, four, one on each of the four campuses and one at UM System, and then they do a number of teleconference and other meetings. But those dates are pretty routine, and there's kind of a rhythm to it, and UMSL hosts the one in December for as long as I'm aware. Yeah. yeah. So was, is that meeting gonna, sorry, I'm losing my voice. Um, is that meeting <coughs> where they're gonna discuss the tuition increases from the rec center as well? And uh, would we be hit with a double fee from the nursing and then like the addition of the rec center? The, I believe, and by boy, Bob, this is where you might be able to help me. I believe the decision about the rec center tuition was made a year ago. Okay. That that's a that decision is done already. Um, so so you so that's been rolled into tuition. That that will actually show up in the tuition number because what UMSL did. This is different than what the other campuses did. Um, and and I think I have this right. Um, because of student input, UMSL adopted a um, tuition model a year ago that rolled many of their fees into tuition. And they did that because of the number of students that we have that get help from their employers. And employers will pay for tuition, but they won't always pay for fees. So they rolled everything into a tuition which also now includes a lot of the things that used to be lined item, you know, $10 for this fee, $20 for that fee. They moved all of that into one because it was um, to the advantage of many students to be able, they could get, they could get support for tuition, they couldn't get support for tuition, <coughs> is my understanding of that. I believe that the rec center moved into that model and several people who are shaking their head yes. So yeah. if I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. If, if so, if so, if that was done because of you know students and their employers, why don't we do the same thing with the supplemental fee 
into our tuition um, to help those same students. Yeah, can't do it by a program. You can only do that with fees that are charged to every student regardless of their major or their program or whatever. Fees that are specific to only a subgroup of students or an A course or A program have to be handled as separate fees. But there, but so, there could, so there couldn't be a separate tuition for UMSL school no, nurses? No. They, well, don't, they don't differentiate tuition yeah. in our system. Yeah. Is, then, is the technology fee separate? No, no longer. That was one of the ones because everybody pays the tech, you know, doesn't matter, doesn't matter what your major is, you have to pay the technology fee. And so that's now rolled in and you don't see a separate line item on your bill. So those of you who have been here, now you, <coughs> you may not pay as close attention to your bills now that you did your first semester you were here. But if you went back and if you've been here for a couple of years and you went back and looked at your bills, there was a lot of line items. If you went back and look at your bill for this past fall, one thing, all those line things aren't there anymore. And the things, the line things that aren't there anymore are the fees that are charged to all students, not things that are specific to a course or to a program. They have to, the only way we could roll them in was, was everybody had to get them. It's how parking got covered. I mean, it's, it's that stuff. Yeah. Other questions? The, the pace of which this is happening is really, um, is, is, I don't know, it's scary for me, um, you know, and the, and the lack of transparency is, is um, concerning to a lot of um, students. Um, well, let me talk a little bit about both the pacing and the transparency. Actually, this is the same process we've used every year on this campus. This is the same timeline, same deadline, same everything. Um, so, so this is no different than what has happened in every previous year. Um, that we, we get told several weeks, not much warning, about when the proposals are due to the campus. And then shortly thereafter, the Student Government Association schedules the meeting. They schedule it. They then send us a list that says, when can you come? Um, we rearrange our schedules to match the Student Government Association. So the timing of this is no different than the past. Um, I, the transparency thing, all I can say to you is I have tried everything in my power to give you as much information as I've got. Um, in, an, in an attempt on a very short time frame to make sure that the students have the same information that we've got. Yeah. Um, I feel like, I, I, I hope I'm not alone in this, I'm pretty sure I'm not alone in this feeling, and that is that the price increase, while it, the intention is to make available more slots for more students in the long run, giving more space, making us a more competitive, a better school for nursing, um, another result of this price increase is, is cutting out people who can't get funding. Um, and I feel like in, yeah. you know, that needs to be taken into consideration. Yeah. Additionally, is this actually like a proposal actually, or is this just kind of not an option? Or is it just gonna uh, No, I mean, until the curators approve it, it is nothing more than a proposal. The curators have the final say on this. The curators look to the Student Government Association on each campus for their input, um, typically, it, and so that's what we that's what the Student Government Association did. It is my understanding that there was a slight change in the Student Government Association process this year because um, they were notified that it was important, or not important, it was required that the Student Government Association body that heard the proposals had to be an elected body. And in previous years, they were an appointed body. And so they had to make a change to make sure that the body that heard them was uh, was an elected group. But that, we don't have any nursing students in there. Well, that and no, well, they don't, we don't even get the chance to elect those, right. those people. Why is that? Well, you get a, you get a chance to vote in mm -hmm. the student government elections. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Right. Every student gets to vote yeah. in student yeah. government. Not, not, not from candidates from, the, from oh. the College of Nursing. I, I, I am sure that if there were nursing candidates who volunteered to be on the Student Government Association, they would be happy to have you. But I will also tell you that in, um, in the years I've been in, I was in the University of Wisconsin system and at the Rush, Rush University before that, um, and as I talked to other people from other universities, typically what happens with nursing students is that they are involved in the Nursing Student Association, 
they're not involved in campus government, and there are only so many hours in the day, and they have to make a choice about what student association that they're a part of. Yeah. So I think that we're, are we a trial for this part? Or? We're combining our class, and we're downstairs in the Seton um, basement, and there's 81 students in our fundamentals class, and there's, I don't know, I think we might be a seat short down there. Are, and um, so what's next? Are they going to do other tuition increases? Um, what other cuts are coming out? Like, we can't put any more people in that class. Well, so the proposal that we have will not increase enrollment. The proposal, this funding, will allow us to maintain enrollment. If you look at this, if you look at this list, um, you know, in fall of 2008, we had, we had 193 students in the major, not the pre-nursing, but in the major. And we currently have 455 students. That's across the traditional program, the part-time evening weekend, and the accelerated program. Without this increase, we will have to start decreasing enrollment. And, I, and I'll be very honest with you, the reason we got a decision on October 30th, the reason I finally got word on that, was because I had told the provost that I was not going to send out the admission letters for the students that were going to start the major in January until we had a plan because I could no longer, because it takes two and a half years, or if you're in the part-time evening weekend, three and a half years to get through the program, and that we could not continue to admit at the pace we've been admitting for the last three years unless we had a better fiscal model. And letters had to go out because registration started on November, early first week in November. So, so that's a piece of, I was saying we would not, we would not even maintain the current enrollment without a plan for Closing that budget gap. Yeah. Um, I asked several questions at the same time, so. Um, and I probably didn't answer all. Yeah, of them. no. So, and the, okay, yeah, yeah, bring thank back you. Just to yeah. the limiting access to low-income students yeah. with yeah. this price increase, has that been sort of absolutely will there be more availability of maybe um, like grants or scholarships? Well, and things like that, so or? so scholarships is one of the major priorities of the mm -hmm. college, and in the last year we have added eight new endowed scholarships. Why are endowed scholarships important? Endowed scholarships are important because they keep on giving versus one-time fundraising where when you spend the money, they're gone. So we've increased the number of four-year scholarships that we can give, and those are all need-based. Those are all need-based. If, if you stay enrolled and meet the minimum requirements, if you get it your freshman year, you're going to get it your sophomore year, your junior year, your senior year. Um, we will continue to raise funds for more scholarships. We are continuing to advocate on a thousand different, the campus, so that's in nursing. There are eight new scholarships in nursing. There is um, part of the strategic priority for this campus and where the funding has come from the campus has been a significant increase in scholarship dollars for all of our students. Those are all need-based scholarships. None of those are merit-based scholarships. Um, so the answer to that is we are working diligently if to increase. in mind that absolutely that perhaps for the last two years, the only new funding that we, well, not the only, the majority, by a lot, the majority of new funding that we've gotten from the system has all been to support scholarships. Okay. I just want to make sure that, you know, yeah. it's kept in mind that... that but, but, no, you, but you are absolutely right. I mean, this mm -hmm. has an impact. Okay. I mean, this no one has wants an impact. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Let me go here first and then... No, no, that's okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, are any of those scholarships going to be made available to the part-time and evening students? Because most of us are working or in their minority. Yeah. Um, the part-time well, evening we weekend, we are actually really working. Uh, that's one of my priorities because the answer to that is it depends. Because the part-time evening weekend students don't meet the federal requirements for financial aid depending on the semester because you don't take enough credit hours. So we are looking for additional funding sources to make all of our part-time evening weekend students have some availability. I thought the way that it was set up though was that if you have at least six credit hours you qualify right. and they've designed the program that way aside from the one semester that people had the option of not of taking right. their writing which I would say most of yeah. our class did we yeah, but not everybody can. You're automatically ineligible because you're also part time for a majority of scholarships. Yeah. yeah. So and I just met with financial aid to talk about uh, and express with development and financial aid that this is actually an area of students that's not benefiting from these increases, and it's right. because of that. Right. So it, 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 on the other hand, our accelerated students run into the same problem. 
because new, relatively new federal financial aid requirements cap financial aid after you've hit a certain number of hours. And it doesn't matter that you don't have a degree yet or this is your second bachelor's degree. Tough. So in essence, so, we're just paying this fee for the full-time students. No, 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 no. Everybody, everybody pays this fee. Right. What I'm saying is the financial aid your challenges. The financial aid challenges are, are two of our three programs. Many of the students in them are, are um, confronted with some unique challenges because of federal financial aid regulations. Yeah. Okay, I'm a minority, so I don't want to offend the minorities in here. But a lot of the scholarships are for minorities. What about the non-minority students? Actually, none of the new endowed scholarships for our for the College of Nursing have that limit. But I will also tell you, not just minority, but when you start <coughs> looking at need-based scholarships, for this campus, because of the number of first-generation college students we have, and the number of students that we have that meet Pell Grant eligibility, there's a, there's a really um, strong correlation between underrepresented minority, low socioeconomic history, first generation college, and so many of those scholarships, they are not targeted specifically at underrepresented minorities, but underrepresented minorities are among the groups that because they are need based, tend to be um, more represented in the pool of individuals who are being considered for that. But it's also first generation college and low, Pell, Pell eligible, low socioeconomic. And that's defined by the feds, not by us. Yeah. As a person who somewhat sees this as a positive thing because of, I hear that we're getting somewhat of a new simulation lab and kind of adding more of the mannequins that you had talked about. Um, how much of this price increase is going to that, or do we not know this yet until after the <coughs> curators meeting? Actually, um, we there is a separate fundraising campaign. The, the new lab will cost us $4 million. Okay. So this isn't for that. We are going to raise that money separate from that. Okay. Because because we have to we have to I know that's why a lot of years to schools get are higher dollars. because of that. Is because oh, yeah. of the simulation Absolutely. labs that they have and that Absolutely. we have one of the, you know, least newest simulation labs. And we're not going to wait. Right. And we're continuing. So there's a brand new study out that looks at the effect of simulation on quality mm -hmm. and safety of education. And I'd be happy to come back another night and talk to you a little bit about what that's going to mean and to our nursing education. Um, but what it means is we have we cannot wait till the new lab is done to really be investing okay. in simulation kinds of things because it is now being shown to be so clearly tied to some quality and safety issues. Um, you know what? So I've, I've taught clinical for a lot of years, mm -hmm. um, and, and there comes a point when you're working with a student in the clinical area that you have to stop them. You know, you can coach them, you can ask questions, you can do everything, but at some point when they're about to, you have to stop them. In simulation, you don't have to do that. You can still do the coaching and you can say, did you think about, did you do, anything? but you can let somebody continue and see what happens if somebody doesn't stop you. And what students tell us, and what the literature is now pretty clear about, is that that is pretty profound work. Okay, thank so, you. Yeah, yeah, back here. Okay. Um, the amount of outside funding that the college of nursing has had in the past like, several years is amazing. What measures are in place to assure that we are still looking for that outside funding? <laughs> uh, I, 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 I chuckle only because a week doesn't go by where we don't have that conversation. Yeah. So, so there was a major, um, so we're always with the University of Missouri system, always looking at what the state funding may be in terms of a narrow focus. The thing that I talked about that didn't make the budget at the end of the day was specifically um, focused on psych mental health. And again, it would have been not just nursing, it would have been the entire state. Um, <coughs> there, is, there are hopes that that will get re-brought up for this year. Um, I'm reminded that the Caring for Missourian money, which again happened before I got here, took three years from the time it was first presented to the time it actually got funded. So the site mental health has only been suggested once. We've got two more cracks at this before we throw in the towel and say it ain't going to happen. Um, and even then I'm not convinced. There is money, the, the number one funding um, for nursing education tends to come from the health resources <coughs> person. Health Resources Services Administration. Um, it's out of the Department of Health and Human Services, 
at the current time, we are figuring out a way, do we have, they take a lot to write those grants. They give you 45 days. The calls are not yet out. They will come out probably sometime in the next week or 10 days. They will all be due before the end of January. We are looking at potentially submitting three of those this year for external funding. So we are, we are always looking for funding. Um, the the uh, funding rate on those proposals is under 20%. Everybody, everybody's in this boat looking for money. So what I can say to you, we're, we just launched a multi-million dollar campaign for the lab. So we are constantly out looking for money and um, short of it being illegal or unethical, we'll talk to anybody. Um, now, as, as a student, I, I just, no, no one's come to me and said, what can we do in the College of Nursing to find money or to, no one's come to us and said, what are your ideas of, of stuff of you know other streams of revenue um, or you know tell us give, give us more of a review of your curriculum to find out where we can cut costs um, and I think you know all of us had to get pretty high grades and pretty tough classes to get here so I think we would be a very good resource for that um, but I we're open to ideas from anywhere I mean what we use is predominantly our alumni and nursing community that have years of experience um, where can we cut costs in the curriculum? I will honestly tell you there's nothing we can take out of this curriculum. Not if we want to maintain an accreditation, accredited program, and if we want to maintain a pass rate like we have in this program. Uh, we've got our next accreditation visit next uh, fall. There is nothing that can come out of this program. Um, you, you might think that there's something that can come out of the program. <laughs> I can almost guess what you might recommend. But I will tell you that when we talk to your future employers and when we talk to folks who are ahead of you and having graduated, what they tell us is what more to put in the curriculum, not what to take out. Right. Yeah. Just a quick But ideas for fundraising and revenue, yeah. we'll take them. Um, I mean, just a quick thought about that. Um, and this is a long shot. Uh, some courses I've taken we don't use the textbook at all. The textbook costs a couple hundred dollars. When I go to buy, you know, sell it back to the bookstore, it's maybe 20 bucks. What if instead, you know, the instructor maybe says at the beginning, don't bother, give that $200 to this fund. You know, I mean, if it's all well, going to the school, school anyway, <laughs> technically, no one's gonna just give it, but it's just, you know. You know, students, realistically, we need to look, be a little more Conservative yeah. with buying too many books. Yeah. That we're not going to And you know, that is something faculty talk about all of the time. And and we have to balance that with, quite honestly, we have to balance that with you're saying you don't use it until you get ready to study for your for sure NCLEX exam. And then you're and then people come back to us and say, why did I sell that? Right. And that's and why it's a, I it's a balance. But still, I mean, I'm just saying, like, you know, that might be a yeah. good, just as an idea for us. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Or maybe we could just sell them to someone else and then just... Well, I think you, you, you we heard a later. great example of sharing books and passing them down. Mm -hmm. and, and and my guess is that passing down continues on when you're getting ready for NCLA. I mean, there's a, there's a sharing of resources that people need them. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry. Oh. So I think the traditional cohort can actually take um, an example from the... Um, accelerated program where they combine some of their classes. If combining classes would be beneficial, I would agree to that to doing that. And for example, informatics and the research and development class, <laughs> those two yeah. be combined instead of having to take two separate classes. And then that frees up um, some credit hours right there. The undergraduate yeah. committee is actually in very, 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 very early conversations about what lessons did we learn from the accelerated changes, what models might we use for the traditional program, both full-time and the part-time evening weekend. Um, they're, they're learning some things about where they combine, maybe they shouldn't, something should, so so we're in, that first group is just getting ready, or just, just getting ready, just graduated, obviously. So we're having to really think through, uh, we've got the first program evaluation data, but they're looking at that, by all means, yeah. The yeah. I'm, I'm still I'm still concerned with the the, 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 the speed of this process yeah. and and how and how what what we together can do to improve this or slow this down to increase the transparency so we can you know not only understand it better but what can we do about it and how can we help and make our, our university better um, because you know I know you said there's you know it's always the same every year 
but no one's ever approached me with a 20% increase in any line item in my budget. And if they did, I, I, you know, I, I'd be going broke or taking out loans or, and, and I know that there are many students in my cohort, um, and you know, we started a petition. We have over 200 signatures, and that's just from three days, mm -hmm. um, a, you know, to say I can't afford this. Yeah. Well, and let me tell you. So I want to go back to the access question. So, so we get that this is a more costly program that there's costs associated with this. We think that financial aid and other things will cover that for you. But you want to talk about access to this program? Mm -hmm. We have to cut the undergraduate enrollment by half. That's when access will happen. You guys know how competitive it is to get into this program now. If we have to start cutting back enrollment, and we will, then what we're going to have to see is, what we'll see is four or five qualified applicants for every spot we've got. And the, the, it, will, it will significantly decrease access to our program. And we know that the, many of the students here at UMSL cannot go to the other places on this list. They can't, they can't. And SIU Edwardsville has an equal problem. I mean, every nursing program has more qualified people that want to be a nurse than there are spots for at the current time. Simulation may change a little bit of that. Um, so we're all, I mean, that is, that is what the challenge of a place like UMSL is. The, the, we're an access, what I consider a, a good urban um, research intensive environment is an access environment for top notch quality nursing education. But it's expensive. And I, I will certainly go back and talk to the provost and talk to others about the budget planning process, um, but to see if there's any way to move that up a little bit. Um, but typically, that's the budget planning. You know, we, we start the new budget on July 1st. We start the budget planning process in September and October. Curators look at it. And so remember, this is a, back to the, um, this is the routine process. Remember last year, we didn't increase tuition and the base tuition and the University of Missouri system and that decision was made at this time of the year before the state budget and then it turned out we didn't get the money we were promised. So this is a, it's a, there's no doubt it's a political piece and I think the curators and the campus leaderships on all four campuses do everything they can to try to have the best crystal ball they can possibly have but it has a lot of moving parts and until the governor and the, and, and quite frankly this year we didn't even know what our budget was going to be till the, the till the um, veto session, and even then the governor held back money from the state higher ed. So we still don't know exactly when we'll get what. So so I will buy all. I mean I think it's I, we can certainly share that students wish that this process could get moved up earlier, but the bottom line is we're not going to know till next July. So even if the curators say one thing, until the state budget gets passed, we don't know what our budget's going to be. Yeah. So kind of just to go full circle, this increase is to just co cover the deficit. It's not really going to extend any lab hours. So, I mean, it'll keep everything the way it is. Okay. Because I mean, if we're increasing prices, I would at least like to see some more available resources, particularly for the nights and weekends. We have our professors coming in. Labs not open. Hours. Labs it's not, not open. open. Yeah, you guys don't get to go. What, are, your what are we paying for? Can I use the lab? I used the dummy like one time, you know? And we can look at all of that. I'll be honest, when we've done it before and opened the lab, we pay staff and staff don't have any students who come. So we have to. That's have not to. my problem, though. You know, I mean, that's not my problem. <laughs> oh, yeah. no, I don't use I, the lab. I should be able to have access to the lab the same as anybody during the day does, you know? Yeah. I got financial yeah. problems, too. I don't bring them in here and start telling everybody, you know? Yeah. So other, yeah. Sorry, can I yeah, add sure a can. to that? Um, has there been given any consideration to say the current students that are enrolled now doing some sort of like grandfathering thing where the incoming class knows up front this is going to be the new supplemental fee, but that for us, 20%, especially I mean, we're going to, my class in particular, and anyone before us, is going to burden that full 20% because we won't be done 
before the next 10% increase in 2016. Right. So, I mean, for me, it's kind of a sticker shock of, wow, you know, I kind of anticipate a usual two to three percent increase per year. And I mean, that's pretty, I guess, at least I think that's pretty standard. But to see 10% in one year and then and next year to get hit with another 10%, and that's not really what I kind of budgeted for when I initially enrolled in the program. I, we can certainly go back. I mean, we still have to close this gap in the same amount of time. So look at, we can go back and we can model some of that. And what we might have to do is for a short period of time, decrease enrollment until that happened. Because at the, at the end of the day, we still have to close this gap. We can't run a million dollar deficit budget. I mean, even something like increasing the, the supplemental like the two to three percent for those that are currently enrolled kind of what we would anticipate yeah now that i know we can't do it's an it's sort of an it's all as i understand it's a it's they have to apply it universally across they don't have the ability to prorate, prorate it and and decide it by individual basically that's doing it by individual student i mean yes there's a group of you but you'd have to say these students are in this group and this and i know that they cannot do that so um but we, we'll, we can certainly go back and look. I make no promises. I'm just saying we can go back and look at that. Yeah, it would be nice to do like a grandfather did because those of us who are here now keep it kind of the way it is or the rate that we were going. And then, yeah. yeah. Okay. I guess what do you recommend we as students do? Because it seems like the only thing you can do is communicate for us. What can we do to help you voice our opinions and well, you know, it's a great question and it's a complex answer. I mean, at the heart of this, at the heart of this, we've got less state funding. You know, we've got very expensive professional programs. Now, I will tell you, the one advantage that you all have compared to many other students on this campus is you're going to get a job. You're going to get a good paying job the minute you graduate which is very different than some of your colleagues who aren't sure what their job opportunities look like and how they will be able to handle that debt. They're not even sure what their job will be and they certainly don't think that they're walking into a job that's gonna start them in the low to mid 40s as a job coming right out of college. So from, I, I would say you don't forget that. As you're talking to other students, don't forget that when other students look at you, they're going to say, you at least know where you're going to go get a job. You're going to get employed. I'm a history major, and I don't know what I'm going to do when I graduate. Um, but at the fundamental level, what you've got is shifting of costs, public education. I mean, I think in, in many ways, students who attended public universities, not just in Missouri, across the country, came to believe that that was the real cost of education. But it's never been the real cost of education. The real cost of education has been supplemented by the states. The recession <coughs> knocked it out of all higher education, public education, public higher education. And the states simply did not have the revenues coming in because of where the economy went to support all of the things that a state has to support. And so in higher education, so in order to maintain access, what we had to do was shift more of the cost, of the real cost of education to the student. So, so what can you do? Everybody you know, helping them understand that it's a good investment by the state to support higher education is a really good thing to do. And, that, and that's not just nursing, that's in general. getting. Getting Jefferson City to understand that the investment in public higher education is a good investment. It's, it's not only good for you as students. By the way, I wouldn't focus so much on that part. What I would focus on is the difference it makes in, in the health of our communities and in the economy of our community. That's what I focus on. A well-prepared nursing workforce helps us deal with some of the incredible issues of disparities and, and poor health outcomes. And nurses from UMSL understand that and contribute to that in a very different way, in large measure because 90% of you will stay in the St. Louis area to work. 
those private colleges, they're going back home, wherever home is, and it may not be Missouri, and it may not be St. Louis. You understand your community, and you will make a difference in this community. Other questions? One more, yeah. just yeah. quick thing. So when we, in the future, address the lab things that you're talking about, that doesn't apply to this mm -hmm. fee change, Well, just will you let us know? <laughs> well, I mean, so so we will continue to make improvements in the lab. <coughs> right. What that what that fundraising campaign will do is basically allow us to gut the ground floor of this building and build a totally new state. And so that's more the renovation right. and construction costs. The equipment and stuff we are going to have to continue to have. sure. I understand right. that. I guess okay. what I'm getting at is more like at what point were there. And I'll just ask you about it later. It's okay, perfect. Just refer to this specific yeah, situation. Okay, yeah. so it's just, yeah. um, I, I, can I maybe sure. take a stab at it? I think you guys are looking for points at which we can continue the conversation so that the that some issues are kind of ongoing, so we're not tied to a process or that it becomes part of how we communicate on a week to week or monthly basis so that there's more flow to sure. communication. And, I mean I, I truly appreciate, you know, having this meeting and giving us this opportunity to, to discuss this. I just there there it's like, you know, okay, so if we're gonna pay this debt off and it's gonna have to be paid at some point anyway somehow, then next discussing, you know, what comes back after that, that's just something that I'm, I'm interested in talking about after you know yeah. the other purpose will be addressed. Yeah. I have one last question. Yep. What are we what are we what are we gonna say to the students who can't afford this and may have to drop out of school and not finish yeah. their nursing degree? Yeah. I don't think anybody will have to drop out of school because I think there are resources to as I said, the cost of attendance and the financial aid and all of that, I think that will cover it. The campus actually already has a couple of programs in place to for the for the um, the completing senior, um, super senior, um, which they've committed to, and that's that's predominantly to help students who ran out of all financial aid um, eligibility to have that. And so and that's um, that's through the that's through financial aid, financial aid. Financial yeah, aid. through financial aid. And a number of nursing students have been um, yes supported through that. And actually, in the latest UMSL magazine is a profile of a nursing student who was supported by that. Um, so it's, you have no. to be within 30 credit hours of graduating. Yeah, um, and there's additional um, scholarship monies available. And so and there have yeah. always been, there have always been resources available for individual students who can make the case that there's an emergency and situation and they simply cannot afford this. There have always been those. I, I think anytime a student. Not that just in nursing. Right, that is identified in, in, in the college <coughs> when they think there's no other option. If I can get, if you can send them to me, and there's, we sometimes in the 11th hour come up with an option, but um, so far in my tenure here, we've been able to, we've been able to make it happen for students that really were looking at, there's no other way that they could persist uh, financially. And, and it just ha actually it just happened for me this week and another one of your peers. So in, in the 11th hour, um, a scholarship came through with some very specific parameters and she met all the criteria and she, they awarded it to her. So otherwise she would not have continued past the semester. So I would say send them, send them our way. We will figure it out. Um, uh, we're looking at different systems where we're at, um, adopting the campus, and it's a new campus system with academic work, so that we make sure that every dollar that we can spend on the students, we are spending on the students. Um, when you do scholarships by hand, sometimes things go awry. Now we have this nice, shiny new program that that I can manage everything beautifully. I can't wait to get, like, really get my hands all over it. Um, but that's an attempt to be more efficient and more <coughs> effective for you guys as, as students. Um, the nice thing about our higher admission criteria is that you guys actually pull in a very large percent of campus scholarships because they're merit-based. Um, so we pay attention to that. Um, we pay into that system so that you guys can also continue to, to get there. 
Um, but I don't think there's a week that goes by that we're, we aren't looking for additional funding sources. Yeah, and, and you know what I didn't say today, but I, I know I said when we, when we, when we all met. Um, when the campus adopted the supplemental fee process a number of years ago, not just for nursing, but for whatever, 20% of those fees go directly into a scholarship fund. And so that scholarship fund will grow as the supplemental fees grow. And as Dr. Allen just said, um, nursing gets more than their fair share.